I'm Jack Webb. I was a member of the armed forces. My serial number was 1646872. You ever read something that hits you right where you live? That expressed clearly what you'd been trying to pin down in your mind for a long time? Well, that's the way I felt about the code when I read it for the first time. What code? The soldier's code. The airman's code. The sailor's and marine's code. I'm talking about the code of conduct of the American fighting man. Now, here's where the code began. Executive Order 10631. By virtue of the authority vested in me as President of the United States and as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, I hereby prescribe the code of conduct for members of the Armed Forces of the United States. Signed at the White House, August 17, 1955. Dwight D. Eisenhower. The combat history of our armed forces begins at Concord, Massachusetts, and ends at the 38th parallel in Korea. It begins in the year 1775 and ends in 1953. Other chapters may still be added. Other will their names in history. We are part of a proud tradition. The code of conduct is a part of that tradition, a new expression of an old, old faith. Article one, I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. If the voices of our American past could be heard now, they would say, that was our code, too. Generation after generation of American fighting men have made this code a living reality. There was Bunker Hill and Saratoga and Yorktown. There was Andrew Jackson and his frontier troops at New Orleans. There was Commodore Perry on Lake Erie. Generation upon generation, adding to the tradition of our fighting forces. The means of warfare changed. The planes, the tactics, the weapons changed. The ships and the guns changed, but not the quality of the fighting men. 169 years from Bunker Hill to Iwo Jima. Courage, self-sacrifice, devotion to country. This is the heritage left to us by those who served before. These might have been their own words. I am an American fighting man. I serve in the forces which guard my country and our way of life. I am prepared to give my life in their defense. Article two is also a part of our long tradition. I will never surrender of my own free will. If in command, I will never surrender my men while they still have the means to resist. You veterans of World War II and Korea, you could have written that. In a fluid combat situation, in a battle of movement where positions change from hour to hour, men can find themselves cut off from their buddies under fire. What did they do? They kept on fighting, wouldn't let themselves be taken, and got back to their outfit, or the outfit got to them, one or the other. Now look at our history. Think back to the times when one, or two, or 10, or 20 men, a handful who wouldn't break, a little group who said, here we stand, not only stood, but turned the tide of battle. The code of no surrender began with General Washington, in the winter of 1777. The situation wasn't just bad, it was desperate. But here, in eastern Pennsylvania, at a place called Valley Forge, 10,000 American fighting men, half frozen and half starved, wrote their names in history. When the British captain demanded his surrender, John Paul Jones replied he had not yet begun to fight. His battered ship fought on. In the end, 
it was the enemy who surrendered. We all remember Bastogne, the hinge of the American line which the whole weight of the German army tried to break. But it didn't break, and more Americans wrote their names in history. Such is our heritage. Now let me show you something that'll give you a laugh. This is an invitation to surrender issued by the Chinese Communist forces in Korea to all American troops. Leaflets like this were scattered all along the front lines. Come right on over to our side and sit out the war in our nice, comfortable prison camps, they said. Needless to say, no one accepted the invitation voluntarily, and those who had the misfortune to be captured found out how nice and how comfortable the enemy camps were. 38% of them never got out alive. I will never surrender of my own free will. That is our code and our tradition. And if in command, I will never surrender my men while they still have the means to resist. But the fortunes of war are sometimes misfortunes. Sometimes, in spite of everything a man can do, he falls into the hands of the enemy. If you were an airman whose plane was shot down in enemy territory, or a seaman whose ship was sunk in enemy waters, or a soldier, or a marine captured in combat on the enemy lines, your first feeling might be one of helplessness, as if suddenly the whole world had dropped out from under you leaving you at the enemy's mercy. Such a feeling is quite understandable, for a minute or two. But your very life may depend on how fast you recover from the first shock of being captured. It is part of our code to resist by all means available, even after capture. That means keeping your mind alert, keeping your eyes and ears open for possible escape. In these first minutes, or hours, or days, you will have your best chance to get away. In this period, the enemy may not be able to guard you properly. He may have to move you from place to place. Security will be at its weakest. The opportunity may come in any form, at any time. In a column marching around a bend in the road, you may be out of the guard's line of sight for a moment. Maybe you can't all make a break at once. Maybe you have to go one at a time, like this. Whether you remain a prisoner for very long may well depend upon your state of mind. Now the enemy, of course, knows this. He wants you to be docile and obedient. In Korea, the Chinese communists sometimes made a little speech to men who had just been captured. Everybody quiet, please. You men should realize your good fortune. Now that you have been liberated by the People's Volunteer Army, for you the fighting is over. You are not soldiers anymore. No more take orders from those who lead you in this unjust war. No more orders from officers. No more military rank. Anyone who use rank on you, you let us know. Where your plan. Not soldiers anymore, the man said. He knows differently, but he figures maybe there are one or two in the group who can be softened up this way. On the other hand, he might take an entirely different tack. You better consider your position. It is foolish for anyone to try escape. Escape is not possible. And for try to escape, you may be shot. Anyway, what is the use to escape? Where would you go? Better you learn to cooperate with us. Sooner the war be ended and everybody go home. Someone try to escape will only cause trouble for everybody. Whether the enemy uses blandishments or threats depends upon how he sizes you up. 
Now, if you're the scary type, he'll certainly threaten you. If not, he'll try some other approach. The enemy knows, as well as we do, that prisoners of war will always try to escape. And the Geneva Convention permits no unusual or extreme punishment for such attempts. As to the final sentence of Article 3, I will accept neither parole nor special favors from the enemy. Now this means you must make no compromises of your status as a soldier. There will be no deals with the captor except for the immediate needs of prisoner welfare. No promises to be a good prisoner. No agreements or understandings that for favors rendered, you won't try to escape. An American fighting man looks upon captivity as a temporary state. He lives only for the hour of escape when he and his buddies will go over the fence to freedom. Article 4. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Maybe your best efforts to escape have failed and you've been taken far to the rear of the enemy lines. There, a prison camp awaits you, perhaps looking something like this. Once you were brought to a place like this, home seems a million miles away. You're in enemy country, at the enemy's mercy. At least that's what the enemy wants you to think. He wants in every possible way to make you feel alone, helpless, friendless. The enemy knows he must first of all break down your military discipline and your sense of unity and comradeship with each other. In Korea, the enemy told all prisoners they were equal. A sergeant first class was just like everyone else. Prisoner no class, they said. Sergeant? No more sergeant. Everybody, same thing. And they said it for a reason. To break down your military posture. To take away the one thing you have. The strength of your group. All of us know how important is discipline in a combat situation. On the ground, on shipboard, or in the air. It is simply the means by which we act together. As a prisoner of war, Discipline is equally important, perhaps even more so. It is the one powerful weapon left to a group of unarmed men. If the enemy will not provide doctors for the prison sick, a disciplined group of POWs can care for their own. If the enemy doesn't care about cleanliness and sanitation, a disciplined prisoner group can make and enforce its own rules of hygiene. If the enemy keeps everyone hungry or doesn't distribute the food equally, a disciplined group can see that all share alike. If the enemy talks up quarrels and bad feeling between prisoners, a disciplined leader will put a stop to it quickly and thus keep the group intact. If the enemy punishes a man unjustly, a disciplined group can retaliate by protesting, as a group, to the camp commander. If the enemy tries to break down discipline by throwing the senior in solitary, a disciplined group will give command automatically to the next senior member. If he, in turn, is taken away to solitary, the next senior will step forward, and the next, and the next, 
and so on, until the enemy's aim is defeated. A prisoner of war is not as helpless as he might think. Not if he belongs to a disciplined group. And he may not be a prisoner for very long either, because soon the group will be organizing escape parties, planning how to get out and how to return to our lines. If prisoners can't organize by military grade, they should elect leaders by vote, as the Geneva Convention provides. Now, if that right is denied, they should create a secret organization. Whatever the means, the end must be achieved. Organize. If I become a prisoner of war, I will keep faith with my fellow prisoners. I will give no information, nor take part in any action which might be harmful to my comrades. If I am senior, I will take command. If not, I will obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me and will back them up in every way. Article 5 of the Code of Conduct. This article reflects a tradition which has always been a part of our armed forces. When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am bound to give only name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. Name, rank, service number, and date of birth. For an American, this is the end of the line. For the enemy, it is just beginning. And uh, what was your name? Private John A. Nelson, service number 4256782, 12 September 1937. Cigarette? Good American cigarette. Not Hong Kong made. Now it takes about 15 seconds to give this necessary information to the captor. But he may spend 15 hours or 15 days or 15 weeks trying to make you talk more. Talk about what? Military matters, first of all. What unit you belong to. What equipment you had. What your mission was. What kind of training you had. But when you refuse to talk about military matters, that's not the end of it either. They want to know all about you as an individual, almost from the time you were born. Now, the theory is information is a weapon they can use later on against you or your buddies. Want to talk about your outfit? It is no matter. We know all these things anyway. But since you're here, it is a good chance for us to get acquainted. You know, before this war began, I was a school teacher. Much better than to be in war, but... What kind of school you go to, Nelson? A nice one? Where was it? I believe you said you come from Pennsylvania? Now, he didn't say Pennsylvania. He didn't say anything. Because he knew that if he answered just one question, it would be one too many. If a prisoner doesn't respond to the friendly approach, the interrogator will often change his tactics. Like this. I'm going to give you just one last chance to start answering some questions. Now, let's see if your memory is any better. Stand up. Stand attention! I have wasted enough time on you. Do you know what we do to men who won't cooperate with us? Would you like to find out? 
This sort of threat is standard procedure. Besides laying a gun on the table, the interrogator says he has worn out his patience. Well, the one thing an interrogator always has plenty of is time and patience. He's in no hurry at all, no matter what he says. Of course, he wants to break down the prisoner as quickly as he can, but if the man won't break easily, he's prepared to keep at him for a long, long time until he is convinced the man won't break at all. Only then will he leave the prisoner alone. In Korea, our prisoners of war encountered something else, too. Something entirely foreign to anything in our experience. For the first time, the enemy tried to subvert us, tried to make communists out of good Americans, tried to make traitors out of American fighting men. All the world knows that this war has been started by the imperialist Western powers, including the United States of America. Of course, I do not mean the ordinary people of your country. It is your ruling class. The rich bankers, the Wall Street warmongers who profit from the manufacture of planes and guns and bombs. They have stopped war to line their greedy pockets. I do not say you men are responsible for starting war. We know that the ordinary people of your country want peace just as we do. So why do you fight us? Today, you have chance to let your true feelings be known without fear. You can become fighters for peace. First, you will all sign this petition to let the world know you have joined with the ordinary people all over the world who want peace. All right now. Everybody will sign here at this table. I say, everybody will sign. You there, come and sign. Everybody listen to me. Sit in your position and listen to me. If he can't convert you, the enemy will try to exploit you for propaganda anyway. For instance, a radio broadcast denouncing your country. For instance, a public confession of espionage, sabotage, germ warfare. And if you think it's all pretty silly, think again, because they're not kidding. Maybe they'll ask for a personal history, the story of your life, or an essay on America. Sounds harmless, does it? Well, don't take that pencil. If you do, they'll know they've got a pigeon. There's a simple rule for all American prisoners of war, and this is it. To sign nothing, say nothing, confess nothing, write nothing. To do all your talking to your fellow prisoners and not to the enemy. When questioned, should I become a prisoner of war, I am bound to give only name, rank, service number, and date of birth. I will evade answering further questions to the utmost of my ability. I will make no oral or written statements disloyal to my country and its allies or harmful to their cause. A prisoner of war camp is an extension of the battlefield. It is a form of combat with the enemy in the realm of the mind and the will. It's a deadly struggle, but an American has inner resources to sustain him all the way. The first of these is faith. 
the religious faith freely accepted and freely practiced by all Americans, wherever they may be. It is the great sustainer, the shield no enemy can take away. All Americans also have another resource, the certain knowledge that America does not forget its prisoners of war, that family and dependents will be provided for, that liberation is certain and will come at the earliest possible moment. This is Germany, 1945. American prisoners being released by American troops. This is Panmunjom, Korea, in 1953. American prisoners coming across the line to freedom. Each man gets a chance to tell his story. Each man is accountable for his conduct and is assured of fair treatment. Article 6 of the Code of Conduct, in just a few short words, sums up the great tradition by which we live. I will never forget that I am an American fighting man, responsible for my actions, and dedicated to the principles which made my country free. I will trust in my God and in the United States of America. Thank you.